Consciousness, a collection of your unique thoughts, feelings and experiences. A level of awareness gifted to you, and you alone. Most have abandoned theirs, shut off from the world around them. Their consciousness of their surroundings slowly diminishes. But, what if there was a way to revive it? To open your eyes, ears and heart to the deepest realms of life itself. A way to pierce the very fabric of time to truly expand your consciousness. To help you on your gifted path, your next set of remarkable masters are waiting. A chief reality hacker and the original time piercer whose work has freed millions of minds around the world. And an acclaimed educator who shows the world that they can do the impossible by going through the unthinkable. Who will all help you answer the question, how do I pierce time and expand my consciousness? All right. I First, I need to soak up the two of you. Nice to... Oh, my God. And I don't think this has ever happened, the three of us having a conversation. And I, I was telling Christina, uh, when I set this up, it's often based on curiosity. What, you know, what what's in my head? Where do I want to go deeper? How do I want to evolve? And who can help me on that journey? And both of you came up at the same time for this conversation. <laughs> and at the time, I had no idea that you knew each other. Can you believe that? I had no clue. <laughs> and... Oh, then when gosh. I reached out, uh, that became apparent, which was insane. The, uh, the way I like to structure this is imagine the three of us are out for dinner. That's the conversation I want to have, not an interview. It's not a podcast thing. It's uh, let's go deep. And I, with the two of you, I want to go literally into the rabbit hole. <laughs> I was thinking of what, what to call this, this conversation. I came up with time and space because of the two of you uh or maybe like how deep can we go and I'll, I'll i'll start with some appreciation for both of you so christina you you well we i think we've i've known both of you for almost eight mm -hmm. years and christina seven years ago you said you know geo you need to know jim quick i have this intuitive hit <laughs> yeah. and you did an intro back then and now he and i are like bffs mm -hmm. And then in the spring of 2016, you said, I actually wrote this down. I can't wait to meet the future Miss Marsico. <laughs> and at the exact same time, I met Stephanie. Uh, and then in 2018, we were talking and you said, you know, I see you making a movie. <laughs> you should really do that. And I said, okay. And then now I have two Emmy Awards sitting behind me from our first movie yeah. that we produced. So, there's something very magical about you. And then Jesse, uh, same thing, eight years. I remember hiring you in 2016 uh, for a, I don't even know what you call it, like a full day coaching session one-on-one -on -one at your house. And I spent a few days at your place in Austin at the time. That was literally transformative and life-changing. And I still remember lessons from then that have impacted me then and impacted me now. So I, well, one of them being, that active appreciation is a skill. So I wanted to start this whole conversation with that. So thank you. And thank you both for already guiding me on my own hero's journey. And I want for this conversation for us to guide others on theirs. And uh, I think my first request is please blow my mind. <laughs> like don't hold, don't hold back. You can say whatever you want, whatever you're capable of saying. And let, let me start with a thing I've been thinking about, and that's a, a, a random question that keeps popping in my mind, and that's how do you, and I'm not asking you this question, I just wanna share what the question is that's in my head because it'll lead to where I wanna go. How does one explain the concept of color to a person that was born blind? And I keep thinking about this, and the only thing I can come up with is analogy. You, you kinda of have to say, you know, red is kinda of hot, because they can use their other senses. And the reason I bring this up is because I think we are very limited by our current set of senses. And that's how we create what we call reality. And yet I believe there are things on the other side of our senses that we simply can't appreciate or sense because we don't have the sense to understand that it's there. And I have a feeling that both of you 
have been on the other side of, of <laughs> our senses. And I want to go there right away, right? And um, I want to know everything. And if this was the last conversation that the three of us ever had, I want you to impart as much of how much you know now on me as possible so that I can hopefully amplify that and share it with as many people as possible. So maybe um, I'll start with Christina. What's on the other side of our senses? You know, when you were asking about uh, the question, when someone was born without seeing color, how would you describe it? I wouldn't describe it to him. I would say, what do you think? How, how does it feel for you? Because the moment we start describing something, we remove the creation of that individual. And, and unfortunately, we live in a world where we are being created by others around us constantly. And that always brings me to tears because, because the basic version of this, you know, the sum of the five people you spend time with, actually underestimates the um, the number one experience, which is that we are being created by every witness that we have around us because of the way they see us and reflect that back to us. And that's good and bad. So when someone doesn't, doesn't have an experience of color, I would want to know what they think it is because my version is not real. I've been told what it is. So that's my answer. Yeah. Jesse, we're basically provided direction in terms of how to perceive and limited by that. I feel like I just need to high-five Christina <laughs> on the screen. If it's possible, like tag, tag Hopefully I get a hug soon, Jesse. So. One <laughs> percent. Yeah, at least two, two and a half years yes. of hugs yeah. uh, build, building up. Um, I, I'm ex beyond appreciative to be in this in this space with both of you. Um, I've been profoundly influenced by each of you uh, in your own way, and uh, just have so much so much admiration for the way that each of you move through the world and the byproduct uh, ripple effects that just seem to just kind of spin off the back behind you and so to be able to to co-create this today is just like a dream dream come true and on the on the heels of what christina just said uh i agree that in allowing someone else to have their own experience to advocate for their own sovereign expression of whatever their experience happens to be uh, I think is an incredible gift that we can give to people. So I love the question, the prompt from you, Gio, of describing a color to someone that, who is blind. And in my experience, learning anything is a simple uh, creation of a relationship between the known and the unknown. And so as we're, as, as everything is moving faster in this world, as everything is, is, you know, the cycles are speeding up, time's behaving differently, people are creating faster than they've ever created before. And so I think it, that that principle seems even more useful uh, to empower people, to encourage people to just share what their experience is. And so if I were to, to be faced with the monumental task of helping someone who is sightless to experience or to express or to elaborate on color, uh, I think that, it, that I, I might share some of my own experience, but I would keep it as open-ended as possible and then just invite opinion and invite conjecture and invite all sorts of their own personal elaboration. Because I think within the expression of something that is previously unexpressed, you get to expand who you are. And uh, it, it's, in, it's astonishing to me how many people accept other people's sort of inherited, regurgitated description of something. And then we use these clunky mouth sounds called words. <laughs> and we just assume that we all know what the hell right. we're all talking about. It's kind of insane, actually. Well, I think I had a, a life-changing moment uh, two years ago when, for fun, I went down, I love going down rabbit holes of, of learning about things, even the history of word and words or etymology. And I was chatting with one of my kids talking about uh, 
months of the year. So I thought, that's cool. Let me look up where do these names come from? And then discovered there used to be 10 months. And then they added July and August to name after the uh, Roman emperors, Julius and Augustus Caesar. And I thought, who the hell has the power to add months? Because there's only 12 months. That's how it is. And then I realized, wait a minute, that was in quotes, man-made. We created the idea of months. And then I went further and deeper and deeper. And I got so, I am so fascinated with the concept of what people call time. Because then I realized if that's made up, well, then hold on. Numbers are made up. Numbers don't exist in nature. Uh, and then time is technically made up. We, we, we all agree to it. It's a common story that we all share. But what if there's something else? And I know, uh, Jesse, I believe you love to go really deep on the concept of time. How do you explain time? And what is time piercing? Maybe that might be another question to ask. No big deal. Let's just jump right <laughs> Let me just make notes as well as we go along. <laughs> uh, yes. So uh, time is a, is arguably the most useful illusion of this particular dimension. Uh, it's extremely malleable. It's extremely personal. It's completely subjective. And that being said, it's nice to sort of chop this thing up into units that we all sort of agree on. That way, I, I forget who it was, but you know, time is what keeps hap keeps everything from happening all at once. But I believe everything is happening all at once, and we get to experience in this subjective reality. Uh, we get to experience relativity, duality. We get to experience up and down, and left and right, and here and there, and male and female, and good and bad, and and that is. I believe what allows consciousness to continue expanding. Um, maybe we'll, we'll jump into that in a little bit. The way that I think about time is similar to music. If let's say, you know, Christina, you're on, you're, you're in your part of town and you know, you could be there in the, in the, in the room that you're in and you could be playing a, a, a little beat. Dun, 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 dun. Now that is in the other room. Uh, and let's say Geo there, uh, up, up just a little bit further north, is like plunking away on the guitar and just doing some riffing and all of that. And so that's in a completely different space. And then I'm over here, maybe on the on the keyboard and just putting down some some notes. So all three of us are creating music from a completely different space, but that music can combine and fill the exact same space. And if we change the metaphor to being a single house, let's say Christina's in the kitchen and and Gio's in the in the den, and I'm in the living room. Even though we can't see each other, the music is not based on sight. The music just just expands, and so the the notes overlap to form a song. Even though the origin of the note is coming from a different geographic space, and I began to think about thoughts being the same sort of thing. Uh, if if thoughts are an energy form similar to a radio wave that you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't touch it, but with the right device, you can receive it and you can amplify it and you can transmit it and you convert, convert that signal into sound. And I started to think about, well, our, what if that's what we are? What if we're like radios and we have access to this, this thought and because of our illusion of time, me today, you know, here on, on a Thursday afternoon, I can have a thought about last Saturday. And for me, in this particular moment in time, that thought is a memory. Now, the version of me, let's say I'm last Saturday having the experience, it is a felt, sensed, um, verifiable experience. So I'm thinking the thought based on what is. But if I were to think forward and imagine something, let's say imagining this conversation, me last Saturday imagining this conversation would be an imaginary experience. Me today remembering last Saturday is a memory. And then I started to wonder, well, if thought sort of vibrates at a higher, higher frequency, then it's not bound by this thing that we call time. And so every thought, I believe, every thought that ever has been thought 
exists. And so we are the transmitters and the receivers of this vibrational energy called thought. And is it such a stretch then to consider that when I'm imagining something, what if that's me just touching the thought, like listening to the music that's being played by what I would call a future version of me who's living that experience? And what if we're just thinking the same thought? And if I'm in this place called now, thinking forward, then it's called a mem uh, an imagination. If I'm this now, thinking backward, then it's called a memory. But what if imagination and memory is the same music, the same note, the same thought, just viewed from different places on this, this time-space continuum? And I began to, to really experiment with it. I began to get tactical with it. And I started to think about, well, shoot, what if I can just sort of chill out my beta uh, brain waves get to that alpha theta border, which is very very simple. You can do it in about 20 minutes, and now you're op that part of your consciousness is operating outside of linear time, and you literally can remember the future. Uh, a mutual friend of ours, James Tan, texted me one time, and he's like, "Dude, I just had a time piercing experience," and so he and his wife were looking at houses, and they found a house, and they sort of excused themselves from the from the realtor, and they were in the kitchen, and they just put their foreheads together, and she started crying. She said, I remember. I remember. This is our home. I remember it. I can see the kids. I can see the table. I can see it. And he was getting emotional telling me, I get emotional thinking about it, that we really can remember the future. And uh, I've decided to, to test this. And so far, it seems to beat every other control that I've found for productivity. Because what better guide can we ever have than the optimal version of us that is most in alignment with our highest values and we can communicate with them one thousand percent okay so we're going to get back to how to communicate with them in a second <laughs> Part, because christina with respect to communication i in, in having thousands of conversations with people in our community there's a lot of things that hold them back from from fully expressing, from sharing their gifts with others and making the biggest impact. The the main, if I had to boil it down to one word, it's fear. And the the superficial fears that they'll describe often relate to the deeper stuff and eventually I feel like it leads to death. I used to be ridiculously afraid of death. Then um a couple of uh, a couple of years ago, I started working with a therapist doing um, uh, psychedelics assisted therapy. And on one of the sessions uh, with some golden teacher, I had an experience that literally felt like communication with higher source that changed everything. And my, my fear of death dissipated because now I think the actual fear is not death, but it's fear of no longer existing as if it's just done. And I know so much of your work is in this realm. So if someone asked you, <laughs> um, <laughs> what actually is death? Or the, in the way that we think of it, how would you help change our minds? I think this is the same question as time. And the yeah. answer to that is, what if that's not the question? Because the question of that kind of forces us to ask the question from a place that we know. And, and if we are not asking this question, I think we are being guided to a different question, which may be, um, you know, why does dif a different experience make time change? And, and what if there is no death? What does that mean, you know? And, um, and, and for your fear, Gio, there's two versions of this. One is maybe a different life, you experienced something very traumatic when you died. And the answer always, I always find that everyone has um, had a very traumatic death experience in, in their life in their other lives. Um, and the other 
trajectories, what are you afraid of not experiencing when you're alive and why it feels like it's death that you're afraid of? And, and I would love the answer from you. Ooh. <laughs> In terms of what I feel, like if I don't do it, it feels like death? Yeah, something you're afraid of um, that feels as much as dying. And if you don't experience this and you die, then that's very scary. And why you feel like death is scary. A lot of people are afraid of death because they're afraid of, that they're not going to live. They're not going to do and be and experience and express and create. Um, what is that for you? Okay, let's go there. Uh, <laughs> I've, <laughs> uh, part of it is I feel like I'm here for a really big reason that is to impact a lot of people, potentially everybody. And that if I were to die too soon, then I won't have achieved my purpose and that I'm, I have a calling that needs to be there. The other component of it, and, and part of this is I've been looking for Easter eggs, meaning looking back through memory, <laughs> uh, what are all the moments that, that were clues on this path that have shaped my curiosity and in terms of my, my own life path. Like I, um, uh, grew up in a Catholic environment. I was an altar boy. I was always in churches and very felt very connected to Jesus. And, um, I think it's literally, I'm scared shitless of the idea of if I speak up in terms of the mission, I, I believe I'm here to do, it will end in crucifixion. It will end in not just death, but like severe, painful suffering of the biggest kind. And that seems to be the pattern of people who are here with a similar calling to, to express and share love as a, as a, uh, a tool and, and let people realize that we are not separate. We are all connected, all these kinds of messages. And that, that's where that fear comes from. What, I mean, you have the answer to that. And, you know, as I'm hearing you say this, it sounds like the emotion is gone from there. And if it is gone from there, where, where did it go? Where's your emotion now? It's, uh, well, there's been catalytic things and, and a big progress in a journey over the past few years. I think that started with, uh, that session with Jesse and the, that one experience, the psychedelics one, it felt like it just completely dissipated. And part, let me, let me share what came out, like messages that came through, especially on that day. One is that, um, I believe the words that came out of my mouth during it were silly humans. <laughs> you can't talk to God because that is, it creates the illusion of separation of us and it as a separate thing. We are God. It, and the I love analogies. And the one that kind of came up with was, uh, if God was a brain, we are all the brain cells. We're all one entity living this human experience and, and, and a collective of stories. Um, the other thing that came up and I didn't understand it was, um, we are not moving through time. Time moves through us. And finally, um, I felt like I was in what I called the, in quotes, moment, meaning an eternal moment. There was no clock ticking. There was no movement of time. There was, it was all at once. And I, I experienced that. And that, so the fear went away, especially because I realized, uh, we are God. Like, so I, that can't die. That energy is, is eternal. And I'm, it just led me now on this path to this moment with the two of you in terms of trying to unpack all of this. Did you see how you, were, how you changed when you shared 
where your emotion has gone to and this incredible place. I mean, I know Jesse saw it too. Like your voice changed, like you sounded like someone else. Your, your just the force was with you, Jesse, <laughs> wasn't it? Tell us, what did you see? Jill, your point about the illusion of that separation, um, I think is, is worth continuing to, to dive into an experience. Um, my observation of you is that you have the ability to be ridiculously present. And when you're present, then it becomes very hard to keep hanging on to illusions. And, and you create a sort of um, effect around you where other people also make it, it's very hard for them to hold on to illusion. And I think that's one of your gifts is, is just being yourself. And as a byproduct of you being in your authentic self, then there isn't anything to do. It just the byproduct just happens naturally. And so if consciousness, God, source, infinite intelligence is the totality of everything that is, well, how the hell do you expand when you're everything? And it seems to me that the only way that, that God can expand is to create an environment where parts of God get to have this experience of free will choice because God doesn't have that. God doesn't have free will choice because there is nothing to choose from. And so what if you just create an environment and put parts of yourself into that environment that have the ability to think and choose different thoughts and have all this relativity and duality, um, but you're never separate from that. And I, I my personal experience of, of God is God is the creator, but God cannot choose. We are the choosers, but we do not create. And so it's a, it's a divine symbiosis where we're out here in this beautiful 3D reality making choices, which really is just whatever we're giving our attention to. And the attention is the currency of transformation. And so if I'm giving my attention to something, then the creator is serving it up consistently through experiences and events and situations and, and conversations and, and, and things that we see in our environment. But it's always trailing behind whatever we're choosing to give our attention to. And so if that's, if that's the case, and if every moment, which is all there is, just this moment of now, then when we become present to what we're thinking, and we begin to see the connection between last week's thoughts, thoughts from two weeks ago, and our current reality, it becomes very easy to observe that there's nothing in our experience that isn't there by invitation and by intention. And so choosing more carefully what it is that we're thinking about and what we're speaking into, into existence, what we're choosing to feel on a consistent basis, that that just sort of hones in the signal. And then the creator is just serving that up within, within our experience. And so I, I really think about it as a, as a beautiful partnership. And this consciousness that is God has perhaps divisions of God like a, like a division within a, a company. And here, here's this division going to go out into the world and experience all this beautiful stuff, but it's all one, one energy. And I, and the last thing I'll say on this for now is that I think our soul as an individuation of this infinite immortal consciousness, that soul exists everywhere at all times. So even the idea of a past life is a very, um, sort of convenient way of thinking about the rest of us because your soul, my soul, each of our individual souls exists as a through line within all of these different times and all these different places, but it, underneath it's that same, same signal. And I just, the crudest way I can think about it is that, you know, how many times have you ever been on your laptop and you've got a bunch of different browsers open? This one's got SoundCloud and this one you're watching a cat video and over here you're texting your friend and, all these browsers are open and it's actually creating a very diverse experience. And yet you're one user having all those experiences. I think about each of those browsers as being like a human life. Those browsers are unaware of all the other browsers. And yet the operator is experiencing all these things simultaneously. And I personally, I just think of my soul 
like that. It's got right now, this browser is open and there's this dude, Jesse, who lives in Austin, Texas in the early years of the 21st century. But there's another version who, well, there's maybe infinite versions, but that one soul is experiencing all of them simultaneously. And tactically, I've just found it to be a lot of fun to just invite my optimal future self to have some conversations with me through imagination, through memory. And honestly, that's where I get all my ideas from. I just like listen for the idea. Here's the idea. It's clear as day. It's a memory from my future self. And I think that in in doing that, then there is a, an opening of that a relationship between divinity and, and divine creator that then gets to create through my focus and my attention. And uh, man, it's just a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> I love you both so much. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, what do you know that I don't know? Like if, if there was one holy shit thing that you've uncovered, I know there's probably a million of them. I think you know everything I think I know and maybe more. And I think the, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know um, anything. I really don't know anything at all. And in the last year I've discovered so much I didn't know. <laughs> oh, no. And I have had a lot of fun um, discovering things that I thought I knew, but I didn't. Um, rediscovering myself and living in such a blissful experience of um, myself and my life. I can't tell you. <sighs> I think. I think uh, the only way to answer this question is by telling you that when when you get to this present moment that you are talking about, um, there is no purpose. There is no um, saving anyone or helping anyone. There's just being in the moment. And... <laughs> I have to say that there lives the most magnificent and happiest moments of your life. And we're here to experience experience the present and, and, and experience the the basic nature of of life, which is um, looking at the trees move and you know, I can see the wind moving the trees outside and move with the trees or, and it sounds weird to, to say it like this, but this is how you slow down time. And I have slowed down time and I'm slowing it down right now for us. I, I know you feel that. And, and when you do that, time doesn't end. It's, it, and there is no fear and there's no stress because you have already created and achieved anything in the moment that you move with the trees or in the moment that, you know, you paint or play music or, and I know Jesse plays the piano a lot and every time I see him, you know, I know that it's a big part of him, even though that's not what he talks about. You know, but that I know that music lives inside of him and he's present in that moment. And I think finding that place for you and the uniqueness of that place for you, because it is not the same as, as, as for other people. It is, it has to be so unique and and it's almost like mixing um, the recipe of a thousand, you know, um, things inside of it. Like when we are lucky to find this place where we can make time stop because of that moment that we feel. I mean, everything changes. Everything. The, the way you look at the world, the way you look at yourself, the people in your life, your relationships, your... Who are you? <laughs> Who are you when all you care about is being here right now? Who is that person? That's what I want to know. And that person who's here, 
is the only person that exists, is the only you um, for here, for now. And there's probably infinite amount of yous in all the other multiverse universes. And I mean, I was obsessed with, I have been obsessed with time and space and um, for many years. And now I am not obsessed with anything. <laughs> and I am having the best time of my life. And 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 this is the, the message, right? <laughs> that I mean ancients talk about, right? Everything, everyone says this, and you're like, what? What does that mean? And and, and I believe that the only way to get there it's it's to allow for it to happen to you because this is happening to me i'm not doing it i am not like constructing anything or for myself for my life i'm not planning my life i'm not creating my life yeah one would think that i am uh but i'm really not it looks like there's a plan in place and oh my gosh writing i'm finishing my book and i'm doing no let me say this to you (laughs) there is no plan and there is no care in the world about what it is that I'm creating. The only care, and that is not even a care because I'm experiencing it in it, is is, am I happy right now? Right now I am. And there is nothing else. And hey, you're speaking to the woman who wanted to make every, every broken heart heal and mend, right? So for me to say that, um, I mean, that's the message. Wow. <laughs> Christina, you should just take that mic and just... <laughs> <laughs> I would if it wasn't so expensive. I'm just <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Christina, you, you opened something up there. Um, that I I see a connection between what you just shared that was so simple and so self-evident. And then Gio, your comment earlier about purpose and fulfilling purpose and, you know, the old fear of not fulfilling the purpose and all of that. Um, You know, a couple of, back in uh, summer of 2020, uh, I was on a road trip and I just realized that I, that I was, I was starting to think and believe things based on many, many, versions that had been inherited and amplified and run through people's filters. And then it was starting, I was starting to put it on as beliefs and, and, you know, predictions and all this kind of stuff. I thought, well, that's not very, what kind of action philosopher am I? This is terrible. <laughs> so I went out on the road. I'm like, I got to talk to them. I got to see if this is happening. I can't watch the screen. So I jumped in the forerunner and did a 7,000 mile road trip around the United States. And during that trip, the message that came in so strongly was to uh, get property, like get, get land. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I hadn't really planned for that, but it was so strong, it wouldn't go away. So next thing you know, I'm back in Texas and looking at land, ended up finding the perfect piece of property, beautiful uh, 20 acres, and spent the first year after I, I got the property, um, spent the first year just being out on the land with no plan, no idea of what needed to be built and constructed and all of that, just being in, in nature. And something was sort of tugging at the edge of my awareness that, that then formed into a, a full on perspective. And as I'm out there with the pine trees and watching the, the rain, you know, how the rain flows over the land and the birds and the deer and the turkeys and the, coyotes and all of this, one day it just hit me that everything in nature uh, can only be what it is. It, It doesn't decide to be something else. It just is what it is. And as a result of its existence, there is a symbiotic relationship between it and everything else in its environment. And I began to realize that nothing in nature has an outcome except for human beings. Human human beings are the only thing, uh, at least that I'm aware of in this space, we're the only thing that can see something that doesn't exist 
and allow it to affect our behaviors to then bring it about. And so once I began to think in terms of there's outcome orientation and then there is uh, simple, natural, inevitable byproducts of, of the existence of something. And one day it just hit me like this, the sun, you know, this, this beautiful, this beautiful light that we have in the, in the sky, this sun, uh, just exists. And as a byproduct of the sun's existence, there are these things called heat and light. And then a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the sun's light hits this place that we call earth. And then as a byproduct of that, we have this thing called photosynthesis. And as a byproduct of that, we have life. And a byproduct of that, these trees exude oxygen. And a byproduct of that, we breathe the oxygen in. But I can't imagine that the sun is like stressing out <laughs> over feeding the earth. The, the earth stopped existing, literally the sun would have no idea that, there, that, that it happened. And the, the, the earth receiving the light from the sun doesn't diminish the sun in any way, nor does it enhance the sun in any way. It's just a natural byproduct. And I began to think about this in terms of you know the work that I do in, in working with leaders and working with people who are, are really creators. And we began to test, what if you didn't operate on an outcome orientation? What if you just fully self-expressed even more and then just looked for the byproducts of your authentic self-expression? And so I developed some frames around that and some strategies and practices. And all of a sudden, people start messaging you back. They're like, dude, this is like the cheat code <laughs> of life. Once I gave myself permission to not have any more outcomes, but instead just be like Christina said, just being in that moment fully as, as self-aware as possible without any sense of deficiency. Like, I don't have that <laughs> thing, so let me make it happen. It's like, no, just, just be. And because being is not a static experience, being is an extremely dynamic experience. And as you're filled up with that energy and as that energy is carrying you and expressing through you, it turns into words and ideas and observed synchronicities and serendipities and all these, all these sort of seeming coincidences. But really, that's just the merging of your intent and someone else's intent. And so I continue to, to see how far I can take this of not having any outcomes but just being fully and then receiving, feeling, getting the idea, and then just do the fucking idea without an attachment to how it works. And every single time it works better than my human brain could have imagined it because that human brain is mostly informed by past experience, which means it's kind of already dead. So you want life, you, you just let the idea come and express it without any concern of how it's gonna happen. And in, in doing that, it seemed for myself and the people that I've gotten to, to go deep in, in this with that purpose stopped being an outcome. The expression of purpose stopped being an outcome and it became fully embodied, fully felt, fully sensed in this moment. And then you begin to like shine a little brighter. Your magnetism gets turned way up until only the things that match your frequency can arrive into your experience. And it's, it is ridiculously liberating and insanely profitable in all of the ways that we might, might measure profit. Could you use me as a case study for this? <laughs> what would that look like? Or what, what advice would you give to me? Yeah. Um, hmm. there's, there's a couple of things. One would be that in either, either lucid uh, meditation and journaling or, or really going deep is to make a conscious connection to moments in your past where you made big decisions that affected the trajectory of your life in a positive way and go back to that guy and give him tons of love and like, dude, you're fucking doing it, man. You're doing it. This is amazing. Open up that channel to that past version of you. And then flip it around and ask for, allow, receive information to come from a future version of you. And you'll begin to feel yourself suspended beautifully between these two components, these two other you know, uh, aspects of yourself. And so that would be one, just open up that channel of active appreciation for your past and eager anticipation for your future. And so kind of getting into that is its own reward. It feels, feels amazing. 
Um, but then secondly is to intentionally uh, invite and then, and then allow and look for moments through your day where you start to get those, those nudges. It's like, oh, I should do this, I should do that. Oh, I need to let that go. And then test it, like go for it. Say no to those things, say yes to these things, just lean forward a little more. And after a couple of weeks of doing this, you will have unignorable evidence of seemingly impossible things start to just blink in and it feels effortless. There's no struggle, there's no strain. And, and I also don't, I mean, it would, be, it would be weird if this was a place you could arrive to because that sort of defeats the whole philosophy. There is no place to arrive to. There's always only now. And then, and, and I'm happy to do this in, in other, some other calls, but there are specific journaling uh, prompts and things that you can do to harness your focus towards a, a, very, fo a very focused and felt and sensed uh, future but an absolute surrendering of the methodology, absolute surrendering of how it's going to happen. Uh, you know, you don't, that's not your job. When it shows up, you'll know it. You won't be able to ignore it. And uh, the, the people that I've gotten to do this with, it's the cheat code to life, man. It is, it is a restoration to absolute childlike wonder. Uh, it shows up in your body. Um, I literally had one guy, and, and his, this is his words, not mine, he said, I realized how much of my, my memories were informing my present moment, and that was showing up in my body. And he was actually given a diagnosis of cancer. And in his, his words, he said, I just forgot to have cancer. And he ended up going back for his you know, six-month checkup, and it was gone. There was not a sign in his body of that malignancy. So not medical advice, <laughs> but... Uh, Seems, seems to be seems to be uh, useful enough to replicate. There's a word that's come up a, a couple of times. It's actually one of my favorite words, and with very little understanding on my part, I just love the word. And the word is dream. And I've been having some fascinating dreams lately. Uh, usually, I don't remember them. So I thought I, I don't know how much each of you have dived into this topic, but. If you do have an answer, what are dreams? And I'm wondering if Christina, maybe you. So, um, you know, I, I actually think you're tapping into um, our consciousness right here, um, Giovanni, because, and this is what that we do all the time. We, um, why it's important to be with the right people in our lives. Um, we are saying things that someone else is thinking and we think it's a, it's our thoughts and and it comes across like thoughts so we can never differentiate between you know my thought your thought i was just thinking about my dream last night and you asked that question so there's a bridge and it's it's real it's a real thing so um what <laughs> well you know, if this is the first time people meet us, that's okay because this is it's the it's it's how it should be. I love remote viewing in my dreams, so I'm in places sometimes um, where I'm supposed to be dreaming, but I'm aware of that I'm there, um, and those experiences are very oh let me look this way and that way. And then as soon as I realize where I'm at, I wake up because my mind is like, that cannot be happening to you. Um, a couple of nights ago, uh, I saw this diamond ring, which is very strange. Um, I'm happily married and um, very in love with my husband and uh, couldn't be happier. So I don't know where, and I have a diamond ring. So it wasn't like for people who don't know me, that's, not what this is and and the ring was suspended um in darkness and um in this dream which was the first remote viewing dream that i could actually move something i was moving the ring um 
with my I, in I was moving the ring, and I said to myself, oh, "What an experience is that? Like I'm still asleep at this point, and I'm moving the ring, and I'm aware that I'm inside this place." And when I woke up, um, I paint, and in I go to sleep, and I dream um, someone painting my paintings in very specific ways. Um, I wake up and it makes no sense, of course, because I wouldn't paint it that way. But then, you know, I look for for those signs of what that means. And then the next night I go to sleep and it continues. Or I believe that your dreams change um, in the way that your awareness changed when you're awake. And, and the more... Um, the more you can slow down your life. The dreams that you get to have. You it just blows you away completely. Um, so that's why when I have dreams that happen the next day, they're, that's not a surprise to me anymore. For me, the surprises are the the, the, the ability to ma maneuver things inside the dream and to be conscious doing it and um, it's fun. Um, I interviewed a award-winning mathematician um, a few months ago. He told me that they've done uh, experiments um, and they know that we are inside the virtual reality glass. It's like we put virtual reality glasses. Actually consciousness it's not here with us in we are we are we are we when we are awake we go like this and we are um we are inside a virtual reality headset um so just put it on it's not here it's over there of course um and he was telling me how now there are real physicists are doing experiments in the fifth dimension um because there is no consciousness that exists here. We don't exist here. We're not here. So dreams are where we are. Um, and sometimes, depending on how this is, we get to bridge the two worlds easier. And that's what I think it is. And a lot more, but... That... Well, let's, let's unpack some of that. <laughs> um, uh... What does fifth dimension mean? And how is it that we are not here? Meaning this, yep. what, what people would call reality mm -hmm. is not necessarily in that definition, actually reality. Well, this is, there's a book that I love so much. Uh, the guy who wrote it died the year after. He wrote it in the 90s. Extraordinary human being called the holographic universe. And... At the time, of course, he was made fun of and, you know, all the things that happened to those folks. But um, but this is a hologram. And, you know, and when people listen to this and say, gosh, what, this is not real, what are you talking <laughs> about? You know, and the only reason why they say that is because that idea has not been normalized in their minds. And... Right. Um, I used to worry every time I would say that, uh, and now I am like, you should know about this. <laughs> this could this this will, could alter everything in your life. You should know that this is a hologram, and we're not really here. We're not. We are not here. We are not here. And um, the brain is the filter. And why, when you have uh, those journeys that you mentioned, it just removes the filter. Uh, easier and you are able to access uh, reality um, as it is uh, faster. It's a shortcut to um, to what is. Um, so this hologram is filtered through um, the place where consci our consciousness is, which is not here. And and I laugh at this because because we're not we are supposed to know it, and we also are supposed to forget that we know it. Um, so we can have the journey of, of exploration and evolution in these bodies. And, it, and this, we're here because this is supposed to be fun, right? Um, we're here to, to, 
to have the roller coaster ride. We're not here to, um, and, and, and when we know that, uh, I mean, <laughs> don't you want a game that, this is a game, right? Spiritual, don't you want a game that has twists and turns? I mean, like the, the other games are not fun. So that's, that's the limited answer that I have. And I know Jesse, I love, I know Jesse loves this topic as well very much. Yeah. Jesse? It, it is uh, 100% a game. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I sometimes think about it like there's a, a spiritual green room and we're all in the green room and we're all hanging out. I love that. Time doesn't yeah. exist there. It's, it's just everywhere. And then it's like, man, I feel really, like I feel really good. I'm like being part of everything and being part of you. We're all the same thing. You know what? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna really go play a game. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on stage, and all the other you know the rest of us in the green room are like, oh, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I think I'm gonna go to uh, I think Earth. I think Earth. Oh, cool. When when are you going? Because you know they have time there. Oh, that's right. Um, you know, I think I'm gonna be born in like the '70s, so I get like the just the tail end of like the grit and the self reliance, and before everything becomes super fragile. So I'll be born then, and then. Uh, and then I, yeah, I want to be there like the early years of the 21st century. And they're like, whoa, man, you're really, you know, what's going to happen. Like, yeah, I know. That's why I'm going. All right. All right. I'm, I'll see you in there. And uh, say, since I'm going there to have fun and to experience love, I'm, I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some like sparring partners. So can you go and be evil in this one? That way I can be more loving and you can be evil and we'll just like play the human thing. All right. Deal. All right. High five. See you in there. And then we're born. And then when you're born, you get dosed immediately with amnesia. And then you forget that you're God. You forget that you're everything. And But you can never totally forget because all of this is all being coded sort of in the green room. So we come out here and we get to experience this theater. We get to experience this play and this life. Um, but it is not predetermined. I know there's a very popular um, conversation right now about determinism versus free will. And my only... Uh, Thoughts for those people who say that free will doesn't exist is that you're you're free to believe that if that's what you want to believe. So I don't think we can mess it up at all. Uh, I think we're in a perfect sandbox, a perfect environment where um, we are coming here simply to experience. And whether it's an immediate experience in the moment that we call good or bad, you know, given enough long enough timeline, enough perspective, and enough wisdom, it's all good. And if it's all good ultimately, then that means that the perception exists that it's all good right now. And remembering that and assuming the absolute positive intent of all the other players in the game and that everybody's doing the best they can um, to make the world a better place from their perspective and the fact that we don't all share the same perspective is how expansion actually happens. You earlier used the phrase consciousness expanding. And Christina just said, consciousness isn't here. So in our limited use of vocabulary and words and all of these things, how do you, how could I describe consciousness to my kids? Um, I've actually explained this to a lot of kids uh, and mostly through questions. Um, which makes it sort of gamified, and, and they they're tend to be a lot more closer to source than we are, so in terms of their, their availability. Um, but a simple thing that, that you can even do right now, if you, if you look at your hand, and then you just give yourself a countdown, and then you're going to move your hand, three, two, one, and then you move your hand, then you have to, you can sort of ask yourself, am I my hand? Or do I have a hand? Hmm. So what would your answer to that be? Do you, are you your hand or do you have a hand? My answer is that I, I have a hand. That... Right. You have a hand. And if you extend that to your other hand, then you have two hands. And you can keep extending it and you eventually realize that you have legs and you have a brain and you have a heart. But who is the you? that has all of these possessions. And then you start looking at stewardship and ownership. If this is my body, 
and it belongs only to me, but it's not me. Well, who's the me and where does that exist? And then I think we come back to soul, which is to me is like the scout of consciousness. The, the, the soul is out here in this time space experience with a body to move through this experience. But to Christina's point about like our consciousness, consciousness is not here. Consciousness is animating and choosing through these things. I'm here in Austin with a computer where I get to be with both of you, but I'm not the computer. I'm not the, the app that we're recording this on. That's a tool through which I'm learning and connecting and growing, but I'm not the tool. And I think in, in the same way, uh, I don't, I'm not my body. I have a body, which I'm very appreciative of, and it's a magnificent vehicle through this life, but I'm not the body. I'm bigger than the body. I'm, I'm, I have many bodies throughout many, you know, all aspects of time, but I don't identify with the body. And so that's maybe a long answer, but you know, if, if you're, if you have, if you're doing a puppet show and you're playing the voices and the characters, you clearly know that you're not the puppet and yet you're making the puppet come to life through all this dialogue and this play. And I, I sort of think of as our bodies and our minds and our brains and our hearts and this world being the stage and we are out here playing the game, playing the characters, but, but we are not the characters. And so we're just kind of back there like cosmic Xbox. We're just like playing the game and we're back there like, yeah, look at that one. Oh. And so that maybe, maybe one day when I take the last breath here and I leave my body behind because it served a beautiful purpose and I come back like this and all my alien family that Christina knows all about, they're all going to be looking around me and they're like, how was it? And I'll have like a cosmic bong and I'll be like, whoa, <laughs> whoo. And they're all going to be back there. Dude, did you feel it? Did you feel it? I'm like, yeah, man, it was good. <laughs> Christina, how would you define consciousness for my kids? I think depending on the age, right, it changes. And um, if they're really young, um, then they'll tell you. <laughs> you know, they'll tell you what it is, right? Um, and the older they get, as soon as you start talking about it, they'll say, "Am I going to die?" You know, and it's almost like they can hear what you're saying, or but that death question has penetrated their um, their experience, and then I think. Um, I would always say consciousness is what you think it is and then that it is the most free thing that we know uh, and we understand. I've had many conversations over the years because of the book, of the second book I wrote, Where Did You Go? And I've had conversations with religious folks, um, uh, fanatically religious folks, um, spiritual a scientific and now one thing that I really can say to my children is that the direction of where science is heading to is that consciousness is real and if the person the kid that you're talking to needs science to un to believe or he needs an experience to believe um, then I decide which way to tackle it I think and the experience is always um, a sure way to uh, to believe for a few seconds um, that consciousness is somewhere else, and um, and that we are somewhere else. And that I, I created this thing, and I've taken many people there and back. Um, I don't do it anymore. Um, I let them go, I let everyone go by themselves because I realized that it was, it was a lot for my consciousness. And, um, but when you experience um, an existence without anything that you know, then you know where it is. And I take my kids, I've taken my kids to what I call the temple journey and um, 
they now have their own experiences of where consciousness is, where their dad is, uh, where they are, where the many versions of themselves are, uh, where they can create um, life. I did go to find death there and I found life. And, and I always say that was the biggest surprise that I went to look in the non-physical world to, to see where that doorway was. And, and then I saw, I saw live life creation. I saw creation. That's, it's, and uh, it was, it was a, an exploration and a journey for myself. Um, but I don't think there is an, I think that we are, Penrose, was it Penrose that said that, that every time we unveil a layer of reality, a new one is waiting for us. So because we are the seers and we are consciousness and consciousness creates, uh, there will never be a time when we will reach knowing. We will reach a different level of knowing 100 years from now, 200 years, 300 years, but we will never ever get to a place where we know enough. Uh, it's not possible, I think. And mathematically, it's not possible. The universe is mathematical. It is, it is, it's infinite. It's infinite. And what I think what, what consciousness is now, what you think it is, what our kids think it is, I do hope it will change uh, five years from now, a year from now, depending on their experience. And I do hope when this physical experience is done, I would know more than I know about it now. Um, but then whatever it is that the next one is, I mean, it's, it's so exciting. Everything. There's nothing. There's, there's no, there's no, there's nothing. There is nothing. And then it's everything. And, and there is, um, I don't know. I guess I am there, whatever it is that the question took me. I'm very present. Um, and I, um, it's funny because every time my old self or the version of me that occupied my thinking time shows up, it wants to explain everything um, in the ways that not very concrete, and I have I have those answers for you, but Gio, what I am sensing from this conversation that we have right now is that I feel like you've given us permission to swim in new waters or new ocean or and just uh, do whatever we want with this conversation, and it should always be like that. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the messiness of this, and and I'm not willing to give you a coherent. Uh, accurate answers, even though I have them, but I don't think I don't think I'm going to give them to you. I'm just going to be here. Well, I think I know why, I, or I believe I know why. It's because that would rob me and anyone watching of the experience of going through the journey. Yeah, it's your and journey. That that discovery, right? And and yeah. that's part of the beauty of all this. Yeah, it really is, and I. I think that the one thing that I want to say, having a right, having um, this uh, bliss-like uh, uh, experience that I've been experiencing in the last few months, um, I want everyone to experience it. But I also know that um, I can't, I can't make other people experience this because. I used to think I can help everyone and I could will so much, like I, and I have, and I did, but I think this, this is something that happens to you. And it's, it's a, it's, I don't want to use the word miracle at all. It's just a thing that has no words. And the only thing I'd say is I hope I don't die from this body now because I have other lessons to learn. I am like, I'm sure I'm not, I want to experience my life now in the way that I've been experiencing it for years and then see what happens from these lenses. I, I do know, I think I know what, what, it will, what will be, but, but, uh, but I'm having such an amazing time and nothing has happened to me. Like nothing has 
happened to make me happier because the things that that can happen for an altered excitement state can also unhappen and this actually even though it sounds like um that we don't have control over it this actually is more freeing because it doesn't it lives inside of me i actually say i hope i end up in a Actually, Henry Miller says it really well, and it's my favorite quote of all time, and I'm going to butcher it right now, but it's about all I want is a room um, with a book and a, and a table and a canvas for sure, and music maybe, but just to watch the world go by. Like, I, I don't want anything else. Like, I really, really don't want anything else. And, and when I have more, I'm like, that I just, I'm just happy with what I have and actually less would be better. So that's where con my consciousness is in less and in nothing. I, I, I would always sense that anyone watching this, listening to us would want some kind of direction. <laughs> Um, like I, I, I've fallen in love with the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell, all that work. And, and, you know, the, each one of us are on our own journeys and we want guides on our path to, to give us direction. And I think the, the one thing that each of you can, uh, with respect to providing people hope or, or a light is, is explaining how our brains, um, that create this reality, it, its primary function, I believe, is to keep us feeling safe and almost to protect us, and yet growth happens outside of that. So what advice would you give to someone who experiences fear based on the definitions of their reality so that they can go on their adventure and leave their ordinary world and go out there despite the fear to start this process that I think the three of us in our own unique ways have already started. How do you, how do you see each of you? Uh, maybe Jesse, I'll start with you. How do you see fear, maybe even fear and pain as more of a, a tool than uh, a, a thing that paralyzes us. My observation has been that, that most people, at least on a consistent daily basis, don't come anywhere near a real life experience that's worthy of fear. And yet, most people are living in a chronic state of, of low-level fear. And so in, in my own life, I've just done the best that I can to lean towards those edges of whatever it is that I'm afraid of. And as long as no one else is harmed, let me lean forward and see, see what happens. And what I found is that every time I take a step forward into something that at first seemed worthy of concern or fear, I began to experience something very interesting that what the fear did was simply narrow my focus so that my priorities were completely clear. The thing that I need to do or learn or share or listen becomes this big. It's the only thing I can, I can you know, it's the only thing that qualifies for my attention. And then after a very, very short period of time, that new space is normalized and there's nothing scary anymore. And then you realize, oh, wow, I'm, I'm alive. This is powerful. And then something new will catch your attention. And it feels both intriguing and a little scary. The only thing you can do is test it. Go lean forward and go see what happens. And um, an unfiltered uh, expression here, a couple of years ago, I became very curious about the law and about you know, what, what, what are these 
human things called law. Because there's natural law, which is very observable and, and uh, reliable. Then there's common law, which you know, this, this every country is, is built on. And then there's all these corporate laws, which is really just sort of a monetization of the population. Same as the church did like 500 years ago. Everything's a sin. This is a sin. No, wait, now this is a sin. And that was really just to extract money and keep everybody in line. So I began to think, well, if there's no injured party, if there's no actual person that, that has been damaged or, or their property damaged, is there a crime? Is it a crime to, to express yourself as long as no one else is, is hurt? So I just began to test. I began to test things. And um, so far, there is no limit. There is no edge. Uh, I trust myself to make choices that are in harmony with the people around me. Um, but full transparency, back in 2013, I thought, let me not file taxes and see what happens. I feel very good about what I do with my money and how my money creates impact around me and my community and, and giving in a way that feels inspired and, and supporting people that, that I believe in. But let me just see what happens if I don't file taxes and nothing happened. And then I decided not to file in 2014. Let's see what happens. Nothing happened. And then after a couple of years, I started to get these lovely, um, just heartfelt <laughs> letters with special green stripe on them. And, and they were so, like, I felt so seen, you know, when it said, dear taxpayer. And I'm like, but that's not me. That's not, they're not talking to me. And so uh, I just stopped filing. And then last year, I got a, a call from a, a, an attorney who I said, hey, if any letters come in, just, you just let me know. So I got a call from him and he said, Mr. Elder, uh, you, we've gotten a call from an examination officer from the IRS and they want to audit you. I was like, cool, this is an interesting leading edge experience. Never had this happen before. So they send me the form and, and I'm checking the whole time. Like, am I, am I out of integrity with my own principles? And every time the answer is no, I am within integrity with my own principles. So I start filling out this little form and it's got great questions on there, like, what's your title? So I said, well, I'm the guy that gets shit done. Um, how many hours a week do you work? Uh, only, only the ones I want to. Um, how much money did you make this year? Mm, more than last year. Uh, what accounting system do you use? Hell if I know. And, and then I, I got tired of answering the questions because I don't know who this person is that's presuming to have authority over me and my property. I never signed a contract. I, I, as a living being, I never agreed to these things. And it was an interesting process of just, let me see what happens. Let me see what happens. And I'm always 100% willing and ready to make good on any agreement that I'm a part of. But I begin to understand that there's a lot of agreements that are assumed. And unless I say something about it, then my silence equals compliance and consent. So I just basically sent back to the lawyer. I said, I'm happy to continue this process, but I do require clarification about who this person is that is presuming to have authority over me because I don't recall giving that authority to anyone. So please ask them these six questions and then I'll be, be happy to continue. The lawyer messaged back and he said, uh, I can't represent you if you're gonna challenge the tax code. I said, I'm not challenging anything. I'm just requesting clarity about who this person is because there actually is no law stating you must pay income tax. There's a lot of assumption. There's a lot of, you know, other stuff. And that was last summer, and I haven't heard anything since. And so I use that as an example, not as advice. It's not a prescription for anybody. But it is. it does seem to me to make a lot of sense to question things that are just accepted as true. If it doesn't feel right for you, I think everyone has a responsibility to themselves and to live in integrity with their own principles to just explore and find out what happens. And that process uh, is a very strategic normalization of unknown scenarios. And if we allow the raw signal of fear to keep us in our spot, then we don't expand. If we allow the raw signal of fear to act instead as a beacon for where we're going to move forward, and, and my 
the only two principles that I that I will steer between are do no harm and take no shit. And so as long as those are are uh, are holding up, then in, in my experience, life just becomes more abundant, more free, more peaceful, uh, more joyful, more loving. And everyone else around that is is obviously free to, to have their own experience. I, I want to end um... Jesse, something you taught me that I think is such an important thing for all of us is that the greatest gift we can give others is our own self-expression and our own joy. Has that, that you taught me that in 2016, has that definition expanded? Um, only, only to, to, only through my observation that it's impossible to authentically self-express without having wonderful byproducts as an inevitable result. And so um, I, I hold by that philosophy. It continues to, to prove itself year after year that the greatest gift is the gift of our own happiness, our own joy, which is then always some sort of self-expression. But there's a flip side to the coin, and that is the greatest freedom is just allowing other people to have their own experience. And so those two things together, um, in, in, in my observation and in my experience, they continue to, to work very well together because you know, I, I, you know, I've said plenty of things online in the last couple of years that I know have concerned people or alienated people or upset people or made people angry. Um, and has wildly attracted and empowered and a whole bunch of other people. Same words, same idea, same picture, same video. So I stopped being concerned with what the impact is going to be. I've just gone deeper into my own purpose and what feels right for me in any given moment. And uh, that was a long way of saying yes. Uh, <laughs> authentic, uh, the, the gift of our own joy, our own happiness, our well-being is the is the greatest gift that we can give. I have learned so much from each of you over time and even way more in the past 90 minutes. Thank you so much for this. This is only the beginning. The the really cool thing about this show and the way it's I'm structuring it is that I want my friends to be recurring characters. <laughs> like like in a in an episodic TV series like, like Jesse's going to come back, Christina's going to come back whole new conversations, whole new group. So thank you both. Uh, love you both very much. Uh, this has been the best. Thank you. With your mind open and your consciousness finally in tune with your surroundings, a darkness begins to grow, biding its time in the shadows, ready to turn your dreams into a nightmare. Who will be the hero's salvation? I'm here to tell you that you, my hero friend, need to become your own dream maker. See you next time where our leader himself will show you how to become an identity engineer.